This conference will now be recorded. Hello, everyone. It's Bar Ruth. Um, I think we'll get started. I have everybody on mute right now, but I'd like to make this a very interactive presentation. So at any time, if you want to uh, bring up a point or discuss something, just take yourself off mute and uh, start talking or else type something in the chat box. And Mary Beth Bowman will be here monitoring that and we'll, we'll make sure we get your questions answered. But I'm going to take myself off the webcam so you can concentrate on the PowerPoint presentation. So let's get going. All right. So. Welcome to our second webinar for tournament directors this summer. We had an initial one in April that discussed 2021 changes that are coming down the pike. Uh, this primarily this um, webinar will be focused on getting back to competition. The uh, agenda that we'll follow. And again, if your phone is um, on mute, please. If your phone is not on mute, that'd be great. Thank you. Um, so we're going to talk about um, sanctioning procedures now in 2020, uh, COVID-19 tournament recommendations that we have, some specifics on running level four and level five tournaments, as well as some other competition formats. Just a brief overview or update of the serve tennis training to get some feedback from any of you who attended it and give you some updates there. To put the new net generation pathway out in front of you again, this primarily is what our April webinar was on, but just again to review it very quickly. And then to give you some context who you can uh, talk to or send emails to if you have questions on running tournaments. So like I said, let's uh, make this interactive. If there's, there's things you want to talk about, just uh, bring those things up. So to start off with, USA tournaments, where do we stand right now for juniors? So as of now, national and Midwest elevate, elevated tournaments are canceled through July and will begin in August. And just on Monday, the national hard courts were announced. They will be held for the 16s and the 18s, the week of August 7th to the 16th. And here in this chart is listed where they will be held. No other divisions will be run for the national hard courts this year. And as you probably know, the Midwest close has been postponed and that's going to be held in November, the 7th to the 9th locations to be determined. And our district qualifiers were all canceled, but we are working right now to replace those with a closed level three Chicago district championship. And we're looking at running that um, in late July, most likely the weekend starting July 25th, but we have a conference call tomorrow with tournament directors involved in that tournament just to make sure we can secure the sites and, um, and courts that we need. The Midwest Junior Standings List will return to a rolling 12-month period because of being off for all these months with the, with the virus. And good news, the Midwest has given us approval to use short sets in our level fours this year so we can get more um, events in, get more kids playing and uh, with a shortened time frame. And then last, just kind of a reminder, if you're running the flighted level fours, the one-day events, that you must use a compass draw or round robin. So any questions on what's going on in junior tennis right now? Okay, so moving on to sanctioning. So um, today we received a record number of sanctions after our morning webinar. So we are going to be busy approving sanctions going forward. Um, the hopefully competition will be able to begin to play June 26th. And the caveat there is that it's pending phase four of Restore Illinois. Once phase four hits, we can start to compete. If it gets pushed, then we'll have to wait to when Governor Pritzker says phase four is opening because that's when sports can begin the competition uh, phase in Illinois. And then last, uh, we have a limited number of 2020 friend at court available first come first serve so if you want to contact mary beth bowman uh, she's going to send those out over the weekend and her email address will be in a slide toward the end of the presentation and just one quick slide about adults this is a pretty much all we'll say about adults is that there's no traditional usta leagues running this summer 
So tournaments would be a great substitute if any of you have the ability to run some adult tournaments. Particularly doubles and mixed doubles will give all these players a chance to compete that they're missing out of in their league play. So if you're interested or have questions, you can send an email to this website, info at chicagodistricttennis.com. Okay, so sanctioning changes. So with um, being off since March from tournaments, what we've decided to do in the Chicago district is allow more than one tournament per age division on the same weekend, which has not been the case in the past. We've had geographical um, restrictions on having more than one tournament per weekend. We'd like to do this again to get our kids out competing, to, to get them the ability to garner some points because states around us have opened and other players are able to compete. So we'd like to do this and get as many tournaments out there for the kids as possible. We plan to stagger the registration deadline. So if a tournament fills and there's a waiting list, then they could those players who are on the waiting list could possibly go to that next tournament. And we're working out all those logistics as we speak. And then the last difference is we're adding a, a parent feedback link on the homepage of the tournaments, which will allow parents the opportunity to give some feedback on tournaments to the CDTA. And just a few little reminders here, and, and this is more because these are um, issues that have come up over the last couple months. So just reminders, when you are sanctioning your tournaments for 2020, please select only level four or level five tournaments. These are the only levels that the CDTA can actually sanction. Any tournaments that are level one to three are either national or Midwest. So again, please select only level four or level five. Additionally, um, when you have the option, please choose tournament director selection for the process when you're processing the player selection type. And then last, for any orange and green ball events, make sure you select orange level one or green level one because this allows your players to receive youth progression credit when they play in those tournaments. Any questions on these reminders or any of the sanctioning process? Okay, we'll continue. So the meat of the presentation follows, and this is what we wanted to get all of you together to make this a discussion um, on how we can run tournaments in the current environment. And what we have learned is National has set some guidelines. I'm gonna share with you some CDTA guidelines, but really the overarching guidelines are those of your club or your facility. So we can make recommendations, but it's the legal uh, staff at your club, your community, your park district, whatever their rules are for competing in this COVID environment, those are really the ones you need to follow. But we're going to provide over the next few slides our recommendations on what that might be. So this document right here, it's not meant for you to read. Um, I've sent it in some prior communications and if you need to see it, I can send it again. You can shoot me an email. But this is the USTA's national recommendations and they put this out on April 22nd. So some of it are already is probably loosened, but I wanted to share with you what the national recommendations were. And then start going into what our CDTA recommendations are. So I've been doing quite a bit of research on what other tournaments around the country, what they've been doing for COVID procedures, what other um, states in the Midwest have been doing. And we as a team in Chicago came up with these recommendations on what we would like to see you all um, put into play, if you can, as much as possible in your specific locations. So the first, and this is the only mandate of all of the things we're going to discuss in the next 15 minutes or so, is that whatever your procedures are for COVID must be posted on your tournament homepage. So we will not sanction a tournament that does not outline what the procedures you're following to keep the parents and the players safe. We've had a lot of feedback from parents that they would like to see this before they enter their child into a tournament to make sure that safety precautions are being taken. So with that, here's a list of some ideas that, that we you might think of or recommendations that we're making. So the first is that you send a pre-tourney email with those same procedures you listed on your homepage. That you purchase hand sanitizer for each court and turn the tournament desk, that you create some type of social distancing signage or markings on the ground to keep your um, players 
six feet from your tournament desk to keep the uh, fans six feet from each other. Consider having extra masks if people do not come prepared. Use officials, especially for level fours, if they are available. And um, according to Mar Marilyn Goldman, there are enough fish officials, so we would like you to use them. Um, here's another recommendation, which is kind of nice, is identify the court monitor. This can be a parent, it can be a volunteer, it could be a child who's looking for service hours. Um, that person's sole duty would be one of matches over, they're going in, they're wiping down anything that could have been touched by the player. The fence posts, um, the gates to get open, the net posts, any parts of the net. So that person, again, their, their role is to keep everything clean and sanitary. Another one, and this came up on our call this morning, so I wanted to add it this afternoon, to consider staggered start times, because that will limit the number of people arriving at your tournament at one time. So I thought that was a great recommendation if you can fit that into your court requirements. And then last, we are realistic and realize if you implement some of these procedures that we've listed, that will cost you more. So adjust your price as necessary. Um, please do it judiciously because we know that it's not a time that we want to take advantage of, of people and not having the ability to play, but you know we, we want to be smart about how we're pricing our tournaments. So let's just take a breath here. Um, are there any chats in the chat box, Mary Beth, or is there anything anybody wants to bring up about these recommendations? Yeah, so Charles has asked um, how long into the future these safety procedures would need to be posted on the home page um, and would it be reconsidered once the CDC has a vaccine? Absolutely. I think, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, so absolutely I would say that we need to post them now until we have further clearance from the CDC and particularly when there's a vaccine. Um, Mary Beth, were you going to say something as well? No, nope, that's exactly what I was going to say. Any other conversation around this? Okay, so that prior slide was pre-tournament. Now we're onto the tournament and your tournament desk. Some of the things that we are recommending that you as the tournament director arrive early to examine the location, remove as many unnecessary items as possible because we're trying to eliminate touches. Um, I saw in some prior, prior communication that it was recommended to leave the gates open, the doors open. I think during a tournament, that's a little bit unrealistic because balls might be you know, coming out quite frequently and disrupt play. So as long as you have that court monitor or somebody wiping down those entrances and the doors and the latches, I, I think we'll be okay. And that's what the sanitized door handles means. Provide masks for your tournament workers when they're uh, speaking with anybody that comes to the tournament desk or within in the um, area that you're working. Determine and communicate what the use of bathrooms are, and then demonstrate a racket bunk to players to start and end the match. And this is more important than you would think, so we definitely don't want to have the handshake, the traditional handshake, but one of our um, directors brought up that the true racket bump is at the end of the match is the way that friend at court will acknowledge that both of the players agreed to the score. So it used to be a shake of the hand, and now it's that racket bump and confirm the score and move on. Any questions about tournament desk or things you want to add? Okay, here's where we'll probably have the most discussion. So player recommendations. This first bullet we've struggled with a bit, but we're, we're leaving it at this for now, which is we recommend that you provide two balls per player with different ball numbers. Um, if you're unable to do so, then have players have a, mark, a marker to label two of their own and then sanitize the marker. And then those players would only serve and touch the balls that have, are theirs or have their numbers on. Um, I'd like to stop here because I wanted to get your feedback. So I know this will cause extra cost. Um, and I've seen, I feel like in the last couple of weeks, there haven't been as many concerned emails or communications about COVID on the balls as there were maybe a month ago. So um, did somebody want to talk about that? Give me their feedback.
I think it's a healthy precaution that we should do. Okay. And again, it will be what your specific club and or facility, what rules you have, but this is where we think is a safe, a safe way to do it. Um, one thing that Marilyn Goldman again had brought up this morning was possibly having a hopper or some, like I said, baskets from the dollar store, which I've purchased is put one behind each player at the fence and their two balls are always in that basket or hopper. And then those are the balls that they use to keep track of. So they're not going into the other courts, et cetera. So you have to be a little creative on how you're going to make this work, but I think it's a safe recommendation. Um, second is remind the players to call it the score because one of the touches that you should remove are the scorecards. And we did have a question this morning that if you had one player use the scorecards and one player only, then that would be a way around not using scorecards. And then after that match, wipe down those scorecards before another match comes out. That is another way to do it. Um, I've seen some tournaments who are recommending players bring their own paper and pen and record the score at changeovers if they have trouble keeping track of score. Another option. Um, we'd like you to ask players to wear their mask when they're not on the court, especially when they're approaching the tournament desk. We would like you to ask your players to place their equipment on opposite ends of the net posts and always change over on their equipment side. So they're not again getting into that six feet space if they're if they're uh, changing sides on opposite sides of the net post. And then last, arrive ten minutes prior to start time and leave immediately after, so that we don't have people congregating and violating the six feet rules. I think I saw a chat come up. Is that right, Mary Beth? Yes. Um... Another recommendation to make sure players understand how to pick up the balls without touching them if it's not their ball. Whether it's just hitting it with their, you know, picking it up with their foot and the racket or, yep. um, you know, rolling with their racket. Yeah, that could be another great one to put on the um, tournament desk at the tournament desk, demonstrate the racket bump and also demonstrate how you can pick up balls without touching them. Good point. Is there any other discussion on this page? I know after the call this morning, I got a few emails after and I would love to hear it now so everybody has the benefit on the call. Are we recommending that players do or do not switch ends of the court? We are, I think when, when you play outdoors, you have to switch ends of the court to make it fair with sun and wind, et cetera. That's why I'm saying put your um, equipment on one net post and the other uses the other net post and you always switch sides on your side where the where your bag is. I think that's the safest. If you're indoors, it's a little different. I, I'm, I feel okay if kids don't switch sides other than if there's a viewing area that's on one side of the court and not on the other side of the court. Doesn't seem as fair. Yeah, I'm not sure if our club's going to let our players switch sides, even if they're just hitting, let alone playing matches for tournaments. So that's just something to consider. Yeah. So again, if your club says no, then that's what you have to do. That's why these, again, are recommendations. But what your club and your club's legal counsel is saying, that would, would trump what we're saying here. Okay. Then we'll move on. So now recommendations for spectators. So tell spectators to practice social distancing at all times. Ask the spectators to sit at least six feet beyond the fence. Request that the spectators wear masks when they're not social distancing while watching the match outdoors and they must be worn at all times indoors. So just on that point, I've seen several different things from different clubs. One club is only allowing one spectator per player. Um, other clubs are saying they're fine with families as long as those families stick together and stay socially distant from the other spectators. So once again, I think it's whatever your club or facility is mandating is what you would do here. But then also arrive no more than 10 minutes prior to the start time and leave immediately after. And 
one other thing I did see also is that one club was having the, uh, they got the cell phone numbers of all of the parents and gave the tournament director cell phone number to the parents. So when the players arrived in the parking lot at the uh, park, then the tournament director would text the parents and say, okay, your child is on, and they would go directly from their car to the court. So um, just another option. I don't know, I don't feel like you as tournament directors need to give your cell phone numbers out to all of these people, but another option if if your club or your facility is, is very um, conservative on following the CDC and COVID guidelines. Any questions on spectator recommendations or comments? Okay, moving on. So now we're excited. We're able to run these events. So I wanted to talk a little bit about the level four and level five events, uh, what they look like, and just some reminders of what you can do with your, with your kids. So first of all, um, level fives are for the low intermediate player. They're the single day showdowns that have been extremely popular in Chicago for the last year and a half. So stick to those, they're for the 10s through the 18s. The level fours, again, are your intermediate and moving up players. They can be one to two days, again, for the 10s to 18s. And here's the scoring formats. I talked a little bit about this earlier, but for the level fives, kind of like the sky's the limit, any different option that you can get these kids playing and playing a lot of matches. The goal is to get kids on the court, get them competing, getting them some match experience. So for level fives, you know, single six game set, four game set, best of three short sets, best of three match tie breaks. And again, what's been really popular in our single day showdowns is the timed matches. So those allow parents to know I'm dropping Johnny off at one o'clock. I pick him up at four o'clock and he's done and we can get on with our Saturday. So that's been really popular. Um, the level fours. Again, we're very excited that the Midwest is allowing all of the districts to run these short set events. Um, in 2021, they're going to be our level six format. So why not start trying them now in ways that you can get more matches in because you're doing the two out of three short sets, no ad scoring, seven point tie break, um, or you can do them as two day events and still do the short sets. So different options for you to run these these tournaments. Barb, um, Patty's reminding us that this year level fours can be three day events and not just two day. Oh, good point, Patty. You are, yep. Good point, good catch. Um, and then the different draw formats that you can have. Um, Again, trying not to have any single elimination events. So get these kids playing. The kids come for the level fives. They get round robins. They get one or two, they get two or three or four matches with a compass draw or a round robin with playoff. Again, getting them to play. Level four also you could do as round robins or a compass. Um, there's we'd like to see some team events. If anybody would like to try some of these team events, they'd be awesome. Um, FMLC or the flighted one day events. Any comments on these running level fives and level fours? I know you guys are all pros at it, but here's the time to speak up or ask some questions. Okay, so for those of you who've run flighted level four, um, you probably know all of this, but some of you may not have seen, there's a nice guide on how to run these events uh, based on the number of players that you get, what type of draw, what type of scoring, et cetera. Um, this is in our tournament director Dropbox. I can send it out. Again, not meant for you necessarily to read right here, but know there's these resources for you. And then in addition to the level five and level four, there's other forms of competition um, that are more for your beginner to low intermediate type player. So don't forget that you can run some team challenges. These might be a little challenging in this environment um, getting a lot of kids on one court is probably not going to happen, but if you can spread them out, um, if you sign up for a team challenge, you'll literally get this box delivered to your door with the banner, with the curriculum, with hats, with things that you need to run the tournament and keep it fun for the kids. And it's usually maybe a two-hour event. Consider it like a play day that we used to run a couple of years ago. 
And then the event that's easier to run in this environment is a team tournament. We had a uh, great league that ran last summer. All you need are four players and they're playing singles and doubles. You need two courts. And if you register these as team tournaments, the USTA will send you the balls, whether it be yellow, orange, or green balls, anything that you need to run the event, plus giveaways for your kids. And there's also some incentive money um, for those of you who would run these. Any questions on team tournaments, team challenges, comments? Okay. All right, jumping into serve tennis. So some of you may have attended the training last week that National USTA put on for serve tennis. So get used to this terminology. Serve tennis is the platform that will be re replacing Tennis Link. Uh, we're very excited about it. It's got some really great functionality, much, much easier to use. But for those of you who were not able to attend the training last week, um, the feedback went back to national pretty loud and clear from most of the tournament directors in the Midwest that we were just getting back to the court. Coaches were just getting out teaching, so it was very difficult for a lot of tournament directors to make those training sessions that were three, you know, three days of last week. So what we have heard is that national is going to do another set of training specifically for Midwest tournament directors. I've heard no more details other than they're they're going to do something specifically for us because it was such a hard time to get the majority of our tournament directors on those webinars. So just some quick updates on Serve Tennis. So it is the new platform, like I said, replacing Tennis Link. There will be additional training, but these dates are pretty much set in stone that tournament directors will begin the application process the week of July 20th. And when I say application process, that's the typical sanctioning process of the past. So um, submitting applications to run tournaments. And the USTA National will send an invitation to all tournament directors to say you have access to serve tennis, you may now start applying for tournaments and that will come out in July. And then the general public will be able to search serve tennis and register players for any of the events starting in November. And this little table, I just put it together just to kind of show you the different terminology. So again, serve tennis is now what Tennis Link or TMT was. The tournament desk functionality on serve tennis is what TDM was. It's now being called a web page where we had typically called it our tournament homepage. And the terminology, like I mentioned above, is the tournament application process that's replacing sanctioning. So any questions or feedback about that training, if any of you attended, it's gonna be a really great system once we get used to using it. Okay, moving on. So I wanted to just point this out that anybody will have to be uh, current on their safe play requirements before they'll get that invitation from National to uh, work on serve tennis. So that is step three steps. The first is you've taken the course, that online course, that has to be done annually. The renewal is pretty simple. It's like 20 minutes online. Uh, you have to agree to the privacy policy, et cetera, every two years, and then have a criminal background check every two years. And I think I saw a chat come through. Yes. Um... Question is, can we still apply for entry-level events throughout the year as we currently do? Um, entry-level meaning level five events? The answer would be yes. Yes, so that's what you can apply for any level five or any level four right now for the rest of the year. And then starting in July is when you can start applying for 2021 tournaments. But once we get into 2021, if I wanted to apply for something additional that I hadn't previously applied for, I could still do that? In in 2020 or in 2021? In 2021. Let's yeah. say I don't yeah. know my schedule yet. Right. Yep. That's just when it begins. So you don't, in July, you don't have to know your schedule for 2021. It's just that's when you can start. And then um, in November is when 
uh, the general public and start searching for tournaments. So that's the reason to just get ahead of the game for probably January, February. So just real quickly, um, this slide we used in our April webinar to just kind of start getting in front of you with what 2021 is going to look like. So basically, um, where the, the box highlighted in red shows you where the tournaments will lie. There'll be seven levels now of tournaments and our current level five and level four events will be termed level seven and level six. So level five and above will be Midwest or national. Level seven and level six are ours. And I like using this slide because I think it helps uh, visualize how that works. So there'll be two national levels, one and two. Uh, there'll be a national and sectional event. Um, level three, the sectional events will be level four and five, and then our events will be six and seven, and those are similar or almost exactly the same as our current level four and level five. Any questions on, on 2021? So were we waiting to find out what we're going to be terming orange ball and green ball events? Yes, I have not heard any clarification on what will be happening with orange and green and youth progression, et cetera. So um, for 2021 right now in serve tennis will only be um, 12 to 18 as far as I've seen in the training and they haven't told us what they'll be doing for the 10 and under. Okay, so to end, I wanted to end with this slide because I thought it was really exciting. I just saw it yesterday for the first time. It's um, an initiative that National has started. It's some ad campaigns that um, I know Chicago wasn't one of the markets where it was going to be rolled out, but hopefully we'll be seeing it on social media and other places, maybe not print, but just to generate excitement for our sport. So if you look at some of these taglines from quarantine to love 15, from frayed nerves to awesome serves, just fun, creative ways to get people back on the court. And this may not necessarily drive players to your tournaments, but it will hopefully drive more people to play and get into tennis, thus resulting um, in the clubs thriving and tournaments getting more participation. But I just wanted to share some of these with you. So here are the contacts for you. So for junior tournaments, if you have questions on how to run your events or any specifics, you can contact me. Um, if you have questions on sanctions or tournament applications, that would be Mary Beth Bowman and her email address is here. If you want to run any adult tournaments like we talked about, you can email the info at chicagodistricttennis.com or contact Jill Siegel on adults. And if there's any other CDTA activities that you'd like to run, the tennis um, team challenges, the team tournaments, etc. You can contact Sarah Stanchin, who is our tennis service representative at sarah at midwest.usta.com. And I will be sending this PowerPoint out to all of uh, my distribution list probably tomorrow morning if you didn't get a chance to write these down. And here are links to the team challenges and the team tournaments if you'd like to know how to register to get those free packages that I showed the slides on. And then a current list of the 2020 tournaments. So last chance to ask questions. I'll put my uh, webcam back on. Not that that helps, but if there's any questions, any comments, I was trying to keep this as interactive as possible. Mary Beth, anything in the chat? No, we are, we've completed our questions. Okay. Well, we're at 8.06, so you can have the rest of your evening. Um, looks like a, a beautiful night. Uh, thank you for joining in. Again, this was recorded, so I'll be sending a link out to the recording as well as the PowerPoint. But if you have any questions, 
please feel free to reach out to me or to Mary Beth. We're just excited to get you guys all back on the courts, back teaching and back running some tournaments for our juniors. So thanks a lot. Thank you, Barb. Thank you.